our time with our speaker. Um, welcome. Uh, uh, I'm Hannah Riley Bowles. I'm the research director here at the Women in Public Policy program. Um, WAP focuses on closing uh, gender gaps in um, economic opportunity, political participation, education, and health. Um, and we have our speaker series uh, every Thursday. Um, at this time, we hope you'll continue to join us throughout the semester. Um, our speaker uh, today is uh, Professor Mary Brinton, um, the, who's the chair of the sociology department here at Harvard, and she is also um, uh, she is the Reichauer Institute professor of sociology here at Harvard, and a faculty associate at the uh, Weatherhead Center for International Affairs, and a member of the executive committee of the of the Reichauer Institute of uh, Japanese Studies. So her research um, combines quantitative and qualitative methods, which is, which is not typical and much needed, I think. I mean, I think each of us, on, or those, those standing on either side of the fence, really um, uh, recognize the value of, of uh, multiple method studies. And she studies um, uh, gender inequality, education, labor markets, economic sociology, Japanese society in particular, um, and comparative sociology. Um, and she focuses in particular on um, how individual action particularly um, affects labor markets and education, access to education. And today she's gonna to speak to us about lowest low fertility in uh, post-industrial society. So I'm looking forward to understanding better what that means. Well, thank you, Hannah, for that introduction. Um, I also have a very minor hat that I wear, which is as a demographer, so that gives me, you know, card-carrying uh, legitimacy to talk about fertility. Um, and I appreciate your mentioning that I do quantitative and qualitative work. Um, so the paper I'm going to be talking about today is um, very quantitative, but this is part of a larger project that has a big qualitative component. And I'm really happy to talk about that, you know, in the discussion period. Um, and I should mention also that my co-author is here, Dong Ju. She will handle all the difficult questions. <laughs> no, Dong, Dong Ju is a PhD student in our department, and we've um, worked on this particular uh, paper together. I changed the title a little bit um, to reflect um, exactly what we're doing. So lowest low fertility in post-industrial societies, and I'll explain what that means to any of you who don't know that term. The role of gender essentialist ideology and labor market structure. So lowest low fertility um, refers to fertility levels, total fertility rates, um, which are number of children ever born to, to a woman uh, on average, um, below 1.5 or by some demographers' um, preference, below 1.3. So way below replacement level, which would be closer to 2.1, accounting for some little bit of um, infant and child mortality. So for a population to be naturally replacing itself, um, on average, women would need to be having two kids, right? Um, and what has happened in the last 20 years in a number of post-industrial societies is that fertility has fallen way, way below that to, to what demographers call lowest low. Um, and there's notable geographical uh, variation in this. Now, at the outset, I should say the U.S. is not one of the countries that has this affliction. Um, and uh, as I've been working on this large comparative project, people have often said, well, we do have it if you look just at white women, right? No, that's not true either. So our birth rate in the United States in the United States is definitely boosted by, especially by the Hispanic population, um, and especially by um, immigrant flows. Um, but if you restrict um, the examination of the fertility rate or number of children per woman only to white women, the U.S. still has a fertility rate that's way above 1.5. It's between 1.5 and 1.9. Um, so even if you look at um, white women in the United States, we do not have, quote, lowest low fertility. Um, now, um, 
there are a number of policy issues. I realize I'm speaking to a policy audience, which is not usually who I'm speaking to. So let me just mention at the outset a couple of the policy issues that um, really trouble people about lowest low fertility. Um, one of them is, of course, when you have very low fertility in a society, you have a very rapidly aging population, right? But very rapidly aging population structure. And so eventually you're going to have a very big, quote, old age burden in terms of health costs, um, in terms of dependency on the working age population. And this is certainly one of the things that gives, you know, policymakers in in East Asia and Southern Europe, you know, keeps them awake at night. Um, and uh, another thing um, that you may or may not think of off the bat, I think of it because, as Hannah said, I specialize especially on Japanese society. It opens up um, debates about the role of immigration in replacing or supplementing the population. And as my colleague in government, Susan Farr, has been known to say quite frequently, Japan has no immigration policy. So Japan is one of the countries that has very low fertility and there's really not a whole lot of movement in terms of the government making um, Japan a more hospitable place for foreigners to come and spend the rest of their lives in and have families and so forth. So it definitely opens up, and, and this is the case in a number of European countries too that have very low fertility. It opens up debates about well, what's the role of um, population replacement not through you know, reproduction of the of the native-born population, but through the influx of immigrants who may have higher fertility. Um, so I, I say those things just to um, sort of remind myself and and remind always my audience that in global terms, you know, we could think, well, low fertility—that's really a great thing because you know the the maintenance of the planet, you know, it may be a good thing globally, but for individual countries it's definitely, um, you know, locally by the national governments regarded as a problem, as a problem that needs to be addressed. Um, and uh, we start, Dongju and I start off our paper that say, by saying that they're pointing out two puzzles that demographers have particularly been struggling with, and one is that um, in the 1960s and 1970s, if you were to look at industrial countries and then post-industrial countries, there was a negative relationship between women's participation in the labor force and fertility. So, you know, it looked like there was a trade-off there, a, um, um, an exchange of, um, you know, have more babies and not be in the labor force. This has changed to a pretty robust positive relationship. So the countries that are, in other words, the countries that are, quote, suffering from the very lowest fertility are not countries that have the highest percentages of married women in the labor force. The instead, the countries that um, have a high rate of female labor force participation among married women tend to have slightly higher fertility. So that's been very interesting to demographers. Mm -hmm. What is that? Just a question of clarification. Is that got to do with overall employment rates? Yes, this is at the aggregate. Yeah, this is definitely at the aggregate. No, 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 but no, I mean, so like a place like Italy, my understanding is like part of the story is that there's just like the, the, there's sort of an overall employment problem. Yeah, that's part of our, okay. that's definitely part of our story, yeah. Um, Mary, could there be um, a third mm -hmm. piece uh, in that equation, and that is that they make the policies that these countries use. Some people in Scandinavia now. Right. Um, right. It, I'll get the to policies that. Policies allow to combine the two, but that's very different from the U.S. Where the policies don't. Actually but we have do. almost as high fertility that's as right. Scandinavia. So that's why I'm wondering. There's yeah, that's a puzzle as well. Yeah, I'll get to that um, shortly. So in addition to the, the female labor force participation, fertility, positive relationship for countries, um, um, a second puzzle that demographers talk about, I would, I would um, say not in a very sophisticated way, but they say this is really weird because the countries that we think of, you know, off the cuff as being very family oriented, all these, e all of East Asia has very low fertility now. 
So all East Asian countries, all of Southern Europe, low fertility. Well, these are supposed to be family-oriented societies, right? Um, so there's been um, quite a lot written about that. Um, and then, and then Iris um, raised another question, which I think we could um, consider as a puzzle, which is, okay, well, how effective have work family, you know, public policies dealing with work family by, uh, balance, um, availability of high quality, inexpensive public child care, and so forth? Do we see? Do we get any leverage in? the variation in those policies across countries to explain very low fertility. And I would say the evidence is very mixed, um, very mixed. So um, again, going to kind of my, my local expertise, Japan has had fantastic policies in place for the last 15 to 20 years. Fertility is not budged, absolutely not budged. Now that's only one case. Um, but we can point to other cases where um, policies, very generous policies, certainly far beyond anything we have in the U.S., have been implemented, and it's not clear that they, it's, it's not clear that they have much effect on fertility. Mm -hmm. Can you give some examples of the policies that the government implemented in Japan to try to move the needle on fertility? So public child care, um, you cannot. Uh, apply to it unless the woman is working full time. But the availability in large urban areas, it varies a bit geographically, but it's pretty good. And it's high quality. Japanese, um, in general, trust this child care. Um, hours are long. Um, they're also, they have a very um, extensive um, maternity leave policy. Um, actually, now it's a parental leave policy, although the percentage of men who take it up is less than 1%, far less than 1%. So, leave policies. Culturally in Japan, aren't people reticent to have the care take place out of the home? Don't yes. Don't really traditional norms. And so, you're getting, you're getting ahead of the story. <laughs> because that's not policy. That's a different, right? So you're leading us forward. I'm leading you into that. <laughs> Were those uh, most of the uh, laws or uh, this kind of policies instituted after the trend happened or even before that? So it varies by country. In Korea, pretty much after. Yeah, the Korean fertility drop has been very rapid. Yeah. The Japanese fertility drop has been very gradual and uninterrupted over 20, 25 years. Um, and the policies in Japan, there have been um, kind of policy waves starting in the uh, early to mid 90s actually. And then the policies have gotten more and more generous, you know, trying to stimulate people to have kids. And again, there's, there's really no evidence that it's encouraged people to have more kids. Um, now I don't want to go off on, um, I, I'm not going to go off on that tangent. <laughs> I'd better not. Um, okay, so um, we can come back to policy because it's not that um, Dong Ju's and my work has nothing to say about policy, but um, I want to show you how we would kind of re be reorienting the focus of some of the possible public policies. Um, so our theoretical framework really has to do with what you were um, intimating um, that um, we really need to look at the, if you want to call them cultural or societal norms surrounding women's roles and men's roles, both at home and in the workplace. And we need to interrogate what labor market structure looks like. And I would say there are three, um, three big um, foci of, of my overall large comparative project. One, first of all, is to bring East Asia more fully into the discussion of lowest low fertility, because this is a very Eurocentric literature. And then there, are, you know, there's a literature in Korea, and there's a literature in Taiwan, and in Japan, but, um, but American demographers and European demographers have really not, to my mind, fully incorporated the East Asian cases into the, into the picture. Um, and because I'm an East Asian specialist, I feel that there, there's local 
there is local knowledge, you know, can be, I have local knowledge that can be brought in. Um, so um, that's one um, big impetus of the project. And if we have time for me to talk about the qualitative work later, I'll, I'll talk about how we're bringing East Asia into that. Um, the second is that we're not going to leave men out. Men are really important to us in this, in this paper and in this project. So, so much of the literature on low fertility has been, well, what can we do to help women balance work and family? What can we do to help women da 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 They're men too, you know, they're the other half of fertility, right? Um, and in a lot of these countries, um, this is the tangent I was going to go off on a moment ago. In a lot of these countries, one of the prime reasons for low fertility is greatly delayed age at marriage. So we're not even talking about, you know, the work-family balance piece, but to the extent that you have um, delay at marriage so that, you know, on average, for instance, men are marrying at age 29 and women at 28, or men at 31 and women at 27. On balance, you're going to have lower fertility if marriage is, you know, a normative precursor to having kids, as it is in many countries. Um, so um, we're really looking at um, the norms that affect men as well as women, and also how labor markets affect men's marriageability and so forth, and ability to become fathers and so forth. So we're bringing men in, we're bring, bringing East Asia in, and um, we're trying to develop a theoretical framework that can, that can do a better job than has been done to date, this is a very ambitious aim, to explain these country level differences. So we're, our analysis today um, that I'm going to be discussing is about country level differences in fertility. Um, okay, so um, this sort of women-centric um, focus of the demographic literature I think it was captured quite well a couple of years ago by um, the cover of The Economist magazine, which showed, it may have been just the Asian, the Asian version, I'm not, I can't recall. But anyway, it showed a lovely looking Japanese woman, you could only see her back because she was fleeing this poor Asian man standing there in a suit with a flower. So it's, it, it was like the retreat from marriage or something. Well, that really kind of sums up the Japanese government and some other governments' points of view. It's really women's fault. Women don't want to marry and they don't want to have the responsibility of being moms. So I thought that was a real nice kind of capsule summary of the bias of some of the literature because I don't think it at all is all about women. I think it's what's going on with young men in these economies is very, very critical. So before I get into our theoretical um, and, and empirical analysis, um, let me just show you fertility rates, and I apologize for the size, small size of this, but these are um, the OECD countries that, that we're looking at in the, this paper. And I've put, oops, I put some arrows in that, um, indicate the countries um, for which by 2008 fertility had um, fallen be be below 1.5. So, um, uh, yeah, Austria was below 1.5 in 1990 and also in 2008. But um, you can see here, um, although I, I realize it's many countries to look at, you can see get the glimpses of um, the geographical pattern that I was mentioning. So Austria and Germany, on the one hand, um, aside from those, what you have is Eastern European countries, so um, Czech Republic, Hungary, sorry, um, Poland, uh, Slovakia, uh, Southern Europe, Italy, Spain, Portugal, uh, we don't have Greece because some of the data that we needed for analysis were missing for Greece. And then the two OECD Eastern, um, East Asia countries, um, Japan and Korea. So the fertility levels um, are lowest in those regions, Eastern Europe, um, Southern Europe, and uh, 
East Asia. And you know, going back to one of the first questions, indeed, in some countries, the fertility decline has been slow and gradual and continuous, such as Japan. In others, it's been much more rapid. Um, and Korea is a good example. Every, I always say everything changes fast in Korea <laughs> and slow in Japan. <laughs> um, so um, the Korean fertility drop has been much faster. Uh, now, um, just as an aside, one of the things that some demographers have been writing about, um, and it tends to be more technical, demographers is, is this just a blip? It, you know, are fertility rates going to recover to replacement level, around two children per um, woman? Um, and there's debate, there's quite a lot of debate about that in the literature. Um, my personal opinion is that for some countries it's going to be very hard for them to recover, but I think you'll see that as I go through our explanation. So we have some real slow moving parts in our theoretical explanation. So uh, what we um, look at um, theoretically in our paper and in my overall project is um, gender norms, the, role, the norms about the roles that men and women should play you know, the prescriptive norms should play in the family and should play in the labor market. And then um, we look at um, the labor market structure and how receptive the labor market is to working women and on the male side, how the labor market is absorbing young men, how able it is to absorb young men so that especially in these more socially conservative countries, young men are able to become breadwinners so that they can get married and so that they can have kids. So there are these moving pieces in our theoretical explanation between the gender role norms, you know, so the real attitudinal, ideological, cultural, um, stuff of um, the society and then the structure of labor markets and also the economic conditions in society. Now we know very well, you know, a year or two ago, Greece, I guess a year ago, Greece was in the news all the time, still is. Well, Spain is in the news all the time now too, right? Very, very serious employment difficulties. Um, Italy, not so great, teetering on the edge of economic um, difficulty, severe economic difficulties. Fertility rates had already fallen in these countries. Um, so uh, that's not a proximate cause of low fertility that people, you know, right now just can't get afford to get married and have kids. But it's certainly not helping. And, and our explanation is very compatible with that. Th that economic view. Okay, um, I think what I'm going to do, because I have a lot of um, analysis to show you, results of analysis, I think I'm just going to jump right to our hypotheses because I, I do want to have plenty of time for a discussion. And I'll just explain our hypotheses as we go along. So, um, we, first of all, hypotheses that fertility is actually going to be lower in post-industrial societies with this very breadwinner-oriented ideology. And because this is an ideology that really does put a burden on young men to sort of um, be able to morally claim that they can get married and become a father if they're really supposed to be a breadwinner. Well, what if they can't get a job? Well, probably marriage is, if marriage is linked to fertility, again, as it is in kind of conservative gender role societies, they're going to wait till they can get a full-time job, right? Or maybe they'll get married and then the couple will wait until they really have, feel like they have a stable financial footing. Um, she can stay home, he can work, and then they'll start having kids. But so that's, um, you know, there's a, there's a piece of, gender role attitudes we think that's really important in terms of the pressures it puts on young men. Mm -hmm. Pardon? The main component of this hypothesis then depends on um, delaying the uh, age at first marriage will definitely delay the uh, fertility. Right. But imagine if, if my, I still want to raise the replacement level is two. That's right. one. If I still want to maintain the level of the fertility rate, 
Well, I can just, uh, for a man, I can just marry younger. Yeah. Right? After I get a job, and even though my entrance to the labor market is delayed, but I can wait until I'm 32, now I'm rich. And I can, now I'm not rich, but I can earn some money. Wow, you're lucky. <laughs> I can earn some money, and uh, support my family, and I can marry younger. Okay, so you have to find a woman who's not really interested in all those labor market opportunities that have opened up for her, right? Yeah. She doesn't want to work. Yeah, or you're wi willing to kind of have, let her work or have her work and then share the child care burden and so forth. I mean, it's possible, but that, there's a, there are a lot of assumptions built into that, right? It's no, possible. No, I agree. I mean, I'm also thinking if eventually this will drive up the uh, age difference within the marriage. It could. That's an interesting hypothesis. But that, you know, that depends on people's preferences, too. Um, also, I think there's a lot of research showing now that fertility goes down for men with age. So I don't think you can assume that everybody's going to have to marry someone. So, and the other side of the breadwinner model that, you know, the men, the, the male in the household should be the breadwinner, um, and this is why we put this phrase male breadwinner, female caregiver model, that um, really presumes that the bulk of housework and child care will fall on, on the woman. So this is, um, you know, quote, conservative ideology, right? Um, the second um, hypothesis, hypothesis Oops, I'm sorry, I'm getting, I'm very technologically antiquated. But now I've got this, I clicked that, which I shouldn't have. Yeah, I just need to get that box away. Thank you. I'll just hold on to this. Um, so now we bring in labor markets and um, we argue that labor market regulation that privileges um, full-time workers will exert, and this is a bit complicated, will exert, exert an overall negative effect on fertility through two gendered mechanisms. One is the following. In um, Spain, which is kind of known as an insider-outsider labor market. In Japan, which has very strong, as you know, firm internal labor markets, it's changed quite a bit, but still um, they, they're very strong in large companies. Um, there's a lot of um, protection for people who get jobs and, and are full-time. And when the economy contracts, it makes it very, very difficult um, for employers to keep hiring in at the bottom, right? So we argue that actually um, countries that have employment protection for full-time workers um, tend to, these are many of the countries where young men are having a really hard time getting into the labor market. Um, I mean, this is Southern Europe, most of Southern Europe, it's definitely Japan, big time. Um, and there are good OCD figures um, on the extent of labor market protection. So basically, labor market protection for full-time um, worker, reg, quote, regular workers, um, privileges people who got in to a company. And if, again, if the economy contracts, it makes it harder to get in because the, the companies have a big wage bill that is more or less permanent, right, set in stone. So um, it can be difficult for young men to get into that system. And for women, um, there's a very, we argue there's a very different effect, which is these are not um, um, labor markets that women can enter and exit and enter and exit. I mean, if, if, you leave, if, a, if you're a man or a woman and you leave the internal labor market of a company, it, you're probably not going to come back in. Even with the policies that the government has put in place, and I can talk more about that, but um, this really presumes a very strong male model of continuous full-time employment across the life course. Mm -hmm. I would say that France is a little bit yeah, France is a really interesting case. And France, if we went back to the former slide, you know, has maintained um, replacement level fertility 
France is a really interesting case. Maybe we can come back um, later. Um, okay, so, um, so we argue that through these two gendered mechanisms, countries that have a high degree of labor market protection for insiders or full-time workers will tend to have higher, higher uh, I'm sorry, lower fertility. Um, for the reasons I've already talked about, we hypothesize that higher rates of young male unemployment is going to be negatively associated with fertility. Um, and finally, um, we hypothesize that there's an interaction effect between a country's gender role attitudes um, and male youth unemployment. So, um, you know, if, if, if it's perfectly okay culturally to go ahead and get married if you're unemployed and you, if you're a young guy and you're unemployed, or, or to become a father not being married, and you're unemployed, you know, that's not going to affect fertility. That It'll affect it some, but not a huge amount, perhaps. But if there are these norms that say, you know, to, be, to become a father, you really got to have a pretty good job, then um, if there aren't those jobs available to young men, we say that's going to depress fertility. So we're, you know, we're trying to work with this kind of institutional, structural, um, picture and then this, um, um, you know, fuzzy area of norms, gender role norms. Mm -hmm. One thing that strikes me kind of building in your comment is that, you know, this is sort of set up in a dichotomous way that the male is the breadwinner but the female is the, but, but even if you just did um, dominant male breadwinner, I mean, I think that from the literature on household bargaining, it's just right. the key is that the, it's not that the woman isn't working, but that the man is earning more than she is. Yeah. To kind of fulfill the male breadwinner model. Yeah, so right. That's, um, I mean, we I still... That, that helps fit with... Mm -hmm. uh, I mean, I think there's one answer in part to the argument that you're making. It's not that, it's not that you just need to find... Right, it's not dichotomous at all. Right, right, right. Exactly. So, so what we use for our ad attitude role? Not only is it not dichotomous, but particularly if you're in a in an economy that's struggling, you may actually need two incomes in order to float your family. Mm hmm Yeah. So it's not. So what stems from that? The, the point is the argument that that why can't just men and oh, right, point, right. just find a woman who's younger, who's not working, to right. this caregiver model. But I think that's that's sort of contradicts the point that you're making. I think the point right. you're making is that yeah. in these economies that are strained, you probably a lot of times need to make right. Things. But the constraint is that it is socially normative for the right, exactly. more than the woman. Yeah, or for the woman to be a f absolute full-time mom, right. you know, the norms of kind of virtuous motherhood, because those tend to go along, those tend to be part and parcel of the of the strong male breadwinner model. Marty? Uh, maybe you can get to this, but shouldn't there also be a hypothesis about the degree of acceptance or non-acceptance of births without being married? Uh, yes, to the extent that um, that contributes. Right, right, exactly. Okay, so yeah, that may, I think that's a major enough point that we should kind of. No, that the, the, we should go off on a tangent um, briefly and, and deal with it because the Scandinavian situation, um, you know, is very different from the American situation, right? So a lot of cohabitations in Scandinavia last a very long time and never result in marriage and and definitely result in kids. So I would put that situation. Um, and, and this is a part of our qualitative project where we've had to talk a lot about what does cohabitation mean in different countries and so forth. But for Scandinavia, I would consider long-term cohabitation to be virtually the same as marriage. So I would consider what I'm saying here to be um, applicable to long-term partnerships, um, whether married or not. Um, the piece about um, children born outside of 
marriage or outside of a stable cohabiting partnership. I mean, certainly that's very important for the U.S. Again, it's not, it's not um, as important for white women, right, in the U.S. It, it's, it's more important for um, African American, the African American population. Um, but yeah, it's, I mean, you're right. This is very much about marital fertility or fertility within stable cohabiting partnerships. Yeah, absolutely. Pardon? It's harder to get those statistics for every country, though. And also, it, it, it gets dicey, right? Because, okay, within a stable cohabitation. Well, what is a stable cohabitation versus a non-stable cohabitation? Um, so, so, let's say, if, taking Marty's point, if, um, if many of the countries in our analysis had a very large contribution to their fertility rate um, by single mothers who are not in a stable partnership, then we would need to adjust our analysis. Um, but I think that's not the case. Again, I would, I, I, Scandinavia fits fine because I'm including stable cohabitations as pr pretty much equivalent to marriage in terms of the norms that people follow and so forth. Mm -hmm. uh, I think there is another situation as well. Uh, for example, there are some countries where uh, people used to live with in big families, like yeah. Um, and it's another situation, like um, for example, I'm from Armenia. In my country, um, young people very often I don't accept this, but when <laughs> they don't have job, they could marry because, for example, the father has a good could job. Could or couldn't. And they can... Could support. or couldn't. Could marry. Could, yeah, could marry because father has a good job and they just, mm -hmm. like, trust them as... Uh, keep them, uh, financially support them, new family. But what percentage of... A big percent, like, I can say more than... Then I'm glad Armenia is not in our sample. <laughs> it's not only in Armenia. It's in our neighbor countries. It's in our neighbor countries, it is the same situation. And also, I'm a Hubert Humphrey fellow, and uh, in our group of fellows, there were a lot of people from different countries. Each one from, from, was from a different country. And the post same situation is in post Vietnam. In, but no. this is post-industrial countries. Yeah, okay. This is countries that have gone through the second demographic transition. And it's, it's, in, it's only post-industrial societies. Which is why we don't have, by the way, Turkey, uh, Mexico, a couple of other, several other OECD countries. So this is only, I should have been, you know, clearer about that. It, it's only post-industrial. No, I think I didn't emphasize the post-industrial um, aspect. Um, yeah, it's only post-industrial societies. Because it, the dynamics are different, and, and the fertility picture is, is very, very different yeah. if, we, if we go outside of um, the post-industrial world. So these are countries that, you know, where fertility rates fell already, right? And then a whole bunch of them, they just kept falling and falling and falling to way beyond what demographers ever predicted. Okay, so... Um, let me run through the, the way that we deal, the way that we, um, yeah, deal with the attitudinal variables. We use the World Values Survey, um, which has a raft of, we think, pretty good um, questions about gender role attitudes. And I don't want to get, I don't want to get too stuck on this because we could spend the next 40 minutes just on this part. But what we did was to pick out gender role attitude variables from the World Values Survey for this set of post-industrial countries that really have to do, again, with men's role in the family um, and in the labor market and women's role in the family and the labor market. So we left out questions like, um, uh, boys and girls should be ra socialized differently or the same because those you know those have to do with gender right but they don't have to do with this we're not sure what that would bearing that would have on fertility so we only pick the gender questions that we think um, have some relationship to our um, 
uh, what we want to explain, which is fertility. And this is the part I don't want to get too stuck on. Um, but um, these are the questions that we picked. Um, and then I'm going to, as quickly as I can, explain um, this figure and how we got there. Um, so here are the questions. This is a first one is really a strongly worded question, and the question is how much do you agree or disagree? Men have more right to jobs than women when jobs are scarce. Well, that's clearly indicating, you know, men's priority, right? Breadwinner model. Women need a woman needs children to be fulfilled. Um, uh, you know, so what's the value? How are people evaluating the importance of motherhood? Work, a working mother's relationship with her children um, is what? Do you remember the word? Suffers um, because of her work. Um, being a housewife, you can read through the rest of them. So these all have to do with the um, economic contribution of uh, husbands and wives, um, and. Uh, yeah, again, their family roles. Okay, so what we did was to pool all the data across our countries. I think it ended up being 24, around 24 countries. And um, we did latent class analysis, which produces inductively, okay, how do people um, feel about these things and crystallize into groups? Okay, so um, the, our analysis yields, and I've been working further on this with another graduate student, and we're getting happily very similar results with slightly different data. There are three clusters of gender role attitudes that emerge. The first one is, is really easy to explain. It's this very, um, what we typically call conservative, male breadwinner ideology. So um, this, is, this shows how each of these three clusters sort of score on each variable. So the cons people in the conservative cluster are people who, you know, tend to agree much more with that statement than the people in the other clusters. Um, and so on and so on. Um, so there's a conservative cluster and then there's what we would sort of stereotypically think of as a, as a very gender egalitarian cluster of attitudes. And then the most interesting um, is the middle cluster, which we call caregiver egalitarians. Why do we do that? We do that because um, this middle cluster, um, so it's the diamond, they actually, um, they're very close they're egalitarian on most things, but not very egalitarian on three key things. So it's a more complicated cluster. Um, so they're not, um, you know, kind of conventionally egalitarian um, on whether husbands and wives need to contribute to income, whether women need to work, um, and um, that house, being a housewife is not um, very prestigious. Is that accurate, would you say, Tongju? I mean, they believe that being a housewife is is fine. Compared to yeah. Are these um, clusters of uh, countries or? Uh, no. So what we do, we pull all the data, all the individual attitude, attitudinal data across all the countries, and say, how do people? Yeah. How do people? How do these attitudes cluster together? And then what we do, and again, I don't want to delay here. But what we do is, after we get those clusters, that you know, statistical solution, then we look at each country, and this is the table we could spend the next half hour on, probably. But we say, okay, in each country, how, what's the distribution like across these clusters? Okay, so um, let's take France because France is so interesting. So France, 52% um, of the individuals in France in the World Values Survey are in the conservative cluster. 41 are in the egalitarian one, right? So it's, it's a complicated case, which I think is, um, has a lot of truth to it. Um, and very few people are in this one. Um, another complicated 
rather complicated case is Spain. Look at Spain. It's a lot more egalitarian, you know, on average than Italy, which in my qualitative work is absolutely the case. Spain is a really fast-moving, um, fast-changing society. Um, Sweden, lo and behold, over 50% of people are kind of straight egalitarians, right? So you can see that. And then this caregiver egalitarian, again, is a complicated category. Um, the U.S. is interesting because um, it's really spread out, which I think is very you know, intuitively accurate. We have quite a distribution of attitudes about women's role in the family in the U.S. Japan and Korea, lo and behold, you know, very large percentage of people believing in straight breadwin male breadwinner, female caregiver ideology. So, um, anyway, that's what we did on the attitudinal front, and then um, I'll show you the final, the regression equation to show you what we're um, what we found. So what we're trying to explain is um, the for total fertility rate across these countries, 24 countries, and we need to look over time because otherwise we only have 24 data points. So we're not doing it cross-sectionally, we're doing it from 1990 to 2008. Um, and any statistical questions can go to don't you from this point out. But um, that's our dependent variable, the total fertility rate. Um, the independent variable um, on the attitude front is the distribution of each population across these categories. And then we add in um, the degree of labor market protection. So let's start at the top. Um, the left out category is the egalitarian. We have the extent of employment protection for regular workers, male youth unemployment rate, we control for um, the G GDP of the country, we include female labor force participation rate, although we don't have a strong hypothesis about it, and we do include um, this policy measure, which, which is very rough, but it's the percent of GDP spent on all types of family policies. Um, <coughs> So, uh, and then in the second equation, we add our hypothesized interaction between the percent holding conservative, you know, straight male breadwinner attitudes and the male youth unemployment rate. Um, so, um, this is our, you know, explanatory model in statistical terms. Um, and it's pretty much what we expected. Uh, Oh, yeah, I said this correctly, the category that's left out. But what I think what is particularly interesting and what we have talked about a lot is that note that the egalitarian is left out. It is the left out category. And relative to that, fertility is higher to the degree that a country has a higher percentage of people in this category. So what does that mean? Our current interpretation is that these, remember these people are people who hold generally egalitarian attitudes, but they have a kind of mixed opinion about whether married women need to work to be independent, whether married women should contribute to family income or not, and so Again, this is our current interpretation, and I'd be interested to hear what people think. But that this is a this is a kind of cluster of attitudes that, if I can put it in these terms, allows people to do family in various ways. You know, in terms of cultural norms, women don't have to be like men. Um, you know, super the super egalitarian model where everybody should work full time. Um, and you know, men and women should share in the child rearing. I mean, even Scandinavia doesn't really fit that model when you talk to people, um, you know, empirically on the ground. Um, 
so this model is a more sort of, we don't know if it's an intermediate way that people are looking at the family and the workplace and men's and women's roles in it, or whether it's really um, a distinct model. Do you see what I mean? I'm getting kind of into the next, uh, next stage of the project. But in any case, these, these very um, male breadwinner-oriented societies tend to have lower fertility. Um, and the, the ones that have slightly higher fertility, the societies that have slightly higher fertility, are these with a kind of more mixed, nuanced um, conception of gender roles. So again, if you think, you know, sort of anecdotally for the US, I think, I think many people would say it is, it's socially acceptable for moms to work. It's socially acceptable for moms not to work. You know, there's not, we don't have an ideology that's universal across society saying women are worthless unless they're in the labor force. Mm -hmm. um, so I recall that the Netherlands ranked highest on the caregiver egalitarian. And that um, leads me to think, it's also one of the countries which ranks highest on part-time work. Mm -hmm. So I wonder whether part-time That's right. Work, uh, this is very yes. high. Yeah. yeah. Whether part-time work is related to the findings um, and I, I, I agree with you, this is a very liberal, I mean, I, I might call it liberal choice society, right? Being a mother is fine, staying at home is fine, yeah. going work is fine. Yeah. Um, but that has, I don't know what really is the causal mechanism where that whole where that comes from. Yeah. But it has led to the highest part time rate in yeah. Europe, at least. That's interesting. Yeah, you're absolutely right. The Netherlands is another case, you know, simil similar to the UK, to the USA, to um, New Zealand, in the sense that there's, a, uh, sorry, I lost it, a lot of variability, a lot of, uh, not an even, but a pretty even distribution across these, right? And in particular, this high particular. And in particular there, in particular. Now I'm scared to go back and look at the fertility rate for the Netherlands in the prior slide <laughs> better be high. <laughs> Look at that. Uh, Yay! <laughs> I took a risk there. <laughs> yeah. Almost two, two generations of very egalitarian labor market institutions and official ideologies, and it almost looks like there's a kind of reaction formation against that. It could be. You know the Eastern European cases better than I do, mm -hmm. Marty. It, those figures on conservative family values seem very bizarre given the. Given the history, yeah. It, it very well may be an attitudinal reaction because. You know, as we know, in some societies with that kind of legacy, um, it's a luxury for women, for mothers not to be able to work, right? It becomes, you know, almost a kind of house glorification of the housewife stage. That could be part of it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, I'm German, but the West, and one thing that attitudes sort of show Germany now is that in the East of Germany, women have higher employment rates, they have higher confidence rates, you know, they diet less, and it's very interesting. They're very in East women. Germany. In East Germany, uh -huh. attitudes do all this work, and family. So there, they want more about the day market, um, and they, they have more highly educated. So it's quite interesting that um, actually what you expected from these European countries has actually so, happened in. But, in but he, the, the, but that's the, it hasn't, no, no. And, you know, in the, in the Eastern European countries, the economic situation is very severe in, in most of them. Not all of them, but most of them as well. Um, so, so what does this mean for policy? Well, as you can see, we don't think it's all about work-family policy. Um, nor do we necessarily think that these fertility rates are going to bounce back up quickly in, in all countries because we don't think it's all about the economy. Um, we think that there's this mix, mixed interpretation or explanation that's based on 
the norms, the dominant norms in the society about men's and women's roles, the labor market structure, and the economic conditions. Um, now I'll speak just on a personal level, but the Japanese government, I think, is finally coming around to the position that, yes, it's, a, it's, a, it's quite a problem for our fertility rate that there are so many young men in um, part-time jobs, in, unemployed or in part-time jobs or in temporary jobs. Um, it certainly does not help the, for the marriage and fertility rates. Um, so I, th I think there possibly is a whole kind of area of labor market policy that has to do with the role, the ability of young people to be incorporated into the workforce um, in the kind of conservative countries, especially young men's ability to be incorporated in, that um, is a piece of the fertility puzzle. Mm -hmm. um, I saw that in the regressions you included an interaction between male unemployment and the attitudes. I think, if I remember correctly, um, have you also tried, uh, and you control the GDP, but have you tried to interact with the GDP? Uh, so I'm wondering you know, how it fluctuates, given, and you have one variable to measure the state of the economy. Um, another natural one is GDP development, and I, I, so I wouldn't be surprised if you found an interaction that in bad times and recessions, these attitudes play in the world. We had yeah. economic growth at one point, yeah. right? Well, actually, the problem is that there is a too high correlation between the unemployment and the GDP. Yeah. You use the use of uh, unemployment here, but you do not control for the overall, I'm uh, just going to this point, because you do not control for the overall uh, economist uh, status. But just the, only uh, GDP, yeah. yeah. It's because the use of unemployment rate can well capture some of the uh, overall unemployment rate that counts. Ah, uh, but the, I'm sorry, this is, yeah. <laughs> the, the, measure, the measure is not just youth unemployment. It's a ratio. It is. I mean, it is just the main unemployment rate. It is? Yeah. So uh, we try the just the regular unemployment rate and may unemployment rate uh, you know, um, not count the youth may. Uh, but actually, the main youth unemployment unemployment rate has a uh, really big impact. I mean, so what we are arguing is it's not just about the unemployment or the economic recession, but the main youth unemployment rate has a kind of distinctive uh, contribution. In order to make the story much more clear, uh -huh. you may want to control for the overall um, male unemployment rate. So that any of the higher use in unemployment right. rate right. is reflecting the idea that uh, because it's bad for youth. We did, at some people. point, we did use the ratio of yeah. male youth unemployment to to the overall, overall or prime age. Prime age male because unemployment, otherwise, yeah. Otherwise, you will be catching the income effects, right? That's sort of overall unemployment that, yeah. effect. Yeah, although, I mean, male youth unemployment is always, I think I can say always just a magnification of, it's always higher than male unemployment. I, I see your point. I mean, we should go back and look at our results for when we use a ratio. Yeah. Your regression analysis, you, you, you didn't uh, include uh, that, uh, such uh, you know, uh, policy variables such as uh, you know, uh, uh, family benefits or uh, availability of uh, care, uh, public care services. Yeah, because... If, if mm -hmm. it, you uh, include these variables, uh, maybe it, it's, you know, uh, policy variables uh, correlate uh, with uh, this kind of uh, attitudes, norms, variables. So, so I, I imagine that I, I suppose see. that uh, these institutional our policy uh, variables and uh, these norm, norms uh, inter interacted. So, so I, I, I don't think uh, this kind of uh, uh, norm, mm. norm mm. variables directly uh, affect uh, the. Uh, well, it's a good it's a good question. I mean, we we do include this 
state expenditure, percent of GDP on family-related policies. Yeah, but of course, and, and there is a positive effect on fertility, indeed. But, you know, because it's, it's across 24 countries, the, um, you know, we can't get we can't get very specific measures that are absolutely equivalent across all these countries. Um, so the work, the work, the comparative work that I've seen looking at the f effect um, on of f various family policies, the work I'm familiar with anyway, tends to choose three or four countries and go more in depth, right, to really look at what those policies are. Um, that's a different approach, you know. No, but I, I, I'm talking about these, these kind of. Approaches. Yeah, this is really the best we could do across a. So, so you, you, you are saying that, uh, uh, that no, no, no factor uh, uh, independently or directly uh, affects the uh, particular. Yeah, that's a strong claim that we, the strongest version of the claim we would make, that the, the, the normative environment, that it's very important to include the normative environment and then think about how it's, how it's interacting with the institutional environment. So, um, can we mm -hmm. compare the coefficients, the magnitude of the coefficients? I don't know. I mean, I don't know whether I can read this as a 5 percentage, so I'm not looking for Oh, no. We, as a five percentage increase in fertility, or what does the no. what does the variable mean? I mean, superficially, it looks like that's more important than uh, culture. Ah, but this is the. I don't exactly yeah. know how to interpret the coefficients. It's, yeah. I mean, because the variables are not. I mean, the coefficients are not standardized. You cannot directly compare different coefficients. The magnitude. The units are different. That would be helpful. I think that would be helpful for people to know, you know, what is the, uh, mm -hmm. how, how much uh, band you get for the box. So yeah, sure. yeah. And we don't, we certainly don't mean to say, okay, culture explains everything. I would no, never, no. never, exactly. never, but, but you're right. You can do it, you know, with your data. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. 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 It, it's a great comparison. Yeah. Yeah. A kind of control, or, or yeah, indeed. I mean, I would say again, based on my own reading of the literature, um, the kind of strength of the comparative fertility literature is in, is you know two or three cases, looking at two or three cases in depth to try to to see right what's going on. Um, and uh, and there are people who are writing about the East Germany, um, uh, former East Germany, West Germany comparison because it is absolutely uh, fascinating. Um, so maybe I'll just say a word about the qualitative work, the in-depth qualitative work that is as part of this project, which is not re reflected here at all. But for the qualitative work. Um, I chose five societies, one in southern Europe, Spain, which I th again I think is quite a complicated case. Rates of cohabitation are very high now. It's not nearly as Catholic a society as Italy. And all the Italian demographers are studying Italy anyway. Um, they've got that wrapped up. They're studying low fertility in Italy. But Spain is an understudied case and it's a really interesting case. Um, 
because it's complicated. Um, and then in East Asia, South Korea, and Japan. And then, so those are my kind of um, intensive, low, low, lowest low fertility cases that we're going to be intensively studying. Um, I'll explain just in a moment what that means, and then I'll then I'll be quiet again. Um, and then we're looking at Sweden and the United States as examples of societies where fertility is at replacement level, or again in the United States for white women, below replacement level, but certainly not very very low. Um, and and the policy landscape, you know, totally different. Not much here for working women, and then Sweden, of course, has been an egalitarian state for decades um, with the policies to support it. So um, what we're doing is um, 80 in-depth interviews with the, exactly the same structure um, of the questions of young people ages 24 to 35 urban young people. And we're really trying, I can say a lot more about that, but basically what we're trying to do is um, hear what people, how people are experiencing things. So here's, here's an example of a question we ask. Um, the first part of the um, interview is about work. And you know we're asking about job responsibilities and da 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 da. And we right off the bat say, are there any um, women with children in your workplace? And the Swedes say, what? You know, like, what? Why are you asking that? Well, the Japanese people don't think that's a weird question because some of them say, no, no, there are no moms in our workplace. Okay, yeah, okay. Um, so right off the bat, you start seeing, you know, people's surprise or you know what what things are just common sense you don't get this stuff out of surveys right and you certainly don't get it out of aggregate data so what's common sense to people here's another funny funny one um, we're asking them about their current work situation so when do you leave work at the end of the day um, when do you leave in relation to your colleagues when do you leave in relation to your boss Again, this, the Spaniards are like, what? What are you talking about? You know, I leave when I'm done, whatever. Sweden, it, it seems like people leave when the workday's over. Japan, yeah, I wait till my boss leaves, <laughs> right? Korea, I wait till my boss leaves. Now these are, we're looking mainly at higher educated people, not super elite, but highly educated. Well, what does it mean for a working mother if she has to wait for her boss to leave? It means if he's still there sitting at the end of the room, can see her, she's here at 6 o'clock. The daycare center, which is an hour away, closes at 6.30. Okay, that's a problem. Her husband has a similar job. He's under the same normative constraints. Okay, 6.45. Maybe the boss doesn't leave till 9. What are her choices? One choice is don't have kids. <laughs> Career is important, don't have kids. Another choice is patch together some kind of arrangement that doesn't have anything to do with policy, really, you know, with family child care policy. The child care centers are not going to stay open until 10 or 11 at night. And most mothers would not, Japanese mothers would not want their babies to be there if they did. Um, so what's she supposed to do? Well, what's the man supposed to do? He can't leave either. Her husband can't leave either. Either one of them leaves, and they're not a committed worker. But aren't, uh, is the interest of global corporations uh, that have more flexible kind of... Uh, For what percentage of the working population? If you come from post-industrial societies, then I would say that, you know, you're more educated and have more... Point. You're trying to divorce more and more jobs when you have virtual teams, so the boss doesn't sit in your same location. Different it's highly aspects. variable across cultures. Highly variable. I think the value of FaceTime, the what the signals that FaceTime give, are highly culturally variable. I mean, even in the U.S., um, FaceTime, arguably, you know, the importance of FaceTime has gone way, way down. But in high-earning jobs. FaceTime still matters. Um, that's just one, you know, dimension. Another, another dimension is how do you feel about um, 
different types of child care. Well, Japanese women tend to say they don't want strangers taking care of their kids. What does that mean? It means anybody outside the family. Try to find a babysitter in Tokyo. Try. <laughs> I have. As a foreign woman, I can, but it's because I can pay a lot of money for a very short stay in Japan. But babysitting is not typical. Teenage girls down the block don't come over and take care of your kids. That's cultural. Okay, how do you deal with that with policy? It's not clear. So, you know, I, I certainly don't want to claim that any of these things are like the bullet, the golden, the magic bullet or whatever that explains things, but I think these, you know, the kind of texture of people's lives and how they're making decisions and how they feel judged by other people for those decisions and how they feel about themselves, whether they're being a bad mom or a bad father or whatever, those are all important and we really, we only know anecdotally about those things, I think, or generally we know anecdotally. Um, so I think we can do better than anecdotes. We certainly can't quantify all those things, but I think there's a whole kind of qualitative area that we can explore more and then ideally one would want to you know figure out maybe by the time I'm in my 80s you know I can figure out how to put together those those qualitative pieces with the quantitative that's the real challenge because you know it's more than storytelling right but um, but I think the knowledge of, you know, individual cultures is really important. And that's why the qualitative data is being collected in each country, obviously, by native speakers. And, um, and we worked hard on the translation of the questions and everything. Um, and we kept in some of those shock value questions. So another, a good shock value question for Japan is, for Japanese women, how would you feel if your husband were a house husband? Who's Japanese in this room? Yada. Yada. <laughs> so a lot of Japanese women say, no, that would be really yucky. So economically or whatever, that might be good, but eh, not quite. No, I don't think so. Um, and then the Swedish women are like, what? That lazy bum. You know, because everybody has to work. Everybody should work. So. That, that's, I have a lot of stories about the cross-cultural comparability. We think, oh, house husband, that's a super egalitarian sort of thing. But the Swedes don't see it that way. <laughs> so anyway, um, that's the end of this storytelling. <laughs> uh -huh.